Chapter Three of Arsène Lupin versus Herlock Sholmes by Maurice Leblanc, translated by George Moorhead. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, Herlock Sholmes opens hostilities. What does Monsieur wish? Anything," replied Arsène Lupin, like a man who never worries over the details of a meal. Anything you like, but no meat or alcohol. The waiter walked away disdainfully. "'What, still a vegetarian?' I exclaimed. "'More so than ever,' replied Lupin. "'Through taste, faith, or habit?' "'Hygiene.' "'And do you ever fall from grace?' "'Oh, <laughs> yes, when I am dining out and wish to avoid being considered eccentric.' We were dining near the Northern Railway Station, in a little restaurant to which Arsène Lupin had invited me. Frequently he would send me a telegram asking me to meet him in some obscure restaurant where we could enjoy a quiet dinner, well served, and which was always made interesting to me by his recital of some startling adventure theretofore unknown to me. On that particular evening he appeared to be in a more lively mood than usual. He laughed and joked with careless animation, and with that delicate sarcasm that was habitual with him, a light and spontaneous sarcasm that was free from any tinge of malice. It was a pleasure to find him in that jovial mood, and I could not resist the desire to tell him so. "'Ah, yes,' he exclaimed. "'There are days in which I find life as bright and gay as a spring morning. Then life seems to be an infinite treasure which I can never exhaust. And yet, God knows, I lead a careless existence.' "'Too much so, perhaps.' "'Ah, but I tell you, the treasure is infinite.' I can spend it with a lavish hand. I can cast my youth and strength to the four winds of heaven, and it is replaced by a still younger and greater force. Besides, my life is so pleasant. If I wish to do so, I might become, uh, what shall I say, an orator, a manufacturer, a politician? But I assure you I shall never have such a desire. Arsène Lupin I am, Arsène Lupin I shall remain. I have made a vain search in history to find a career comparable to mine. A life better filled or more intense. Napoleon? Yes, perhaps. But Napoleon, toward the close of his career, when all Europe was trying to crush him, asked himself on the eve of each battle if it would not be his last. Was he serious, or was he joking? He became more animated as he proceeded. That is everything, do you understand? The danger, the continuous feeling of danger. To breathe it as you breathe the air, to scent it in every breath of wind, to detect it in every unusual sound, and in the midst of the tempest, to remain calm and not to stumble. Otherwise, you are lost. There is only one sensation equal to it, that of the chauffeur in an automobile race. But that race lasts only a few hours. My race continues until death. What fantasy! I exclaimed. And you wish me to believe that you have no particular motive for your adoption of that exciting life. Come, he said with a smile. You are a clever psychologist. Work it out for yourself. He poured himself a glass of water drank it, and said, "'Did you read Les Temps today?' "'No.' "'Herlock Sholmes crossed the Channel this afternoon, and arrived in Paris about six o'clock. "'The deuce! What is he coming for?' "'A little journey he has undertaken at the request of the Count and Countess of Croisson, Monsieur Gerbois, and the nephew of Baron d'Autrec. "'They met him at the Northern Railway Station, took him to meet Janimard, and at this moment the six of them are holding a consultation. Despite a strong temptation to do so, I had never ventured to question Arsène Lupin concerning any action of his private life, unless he had first mentioned the subject to me. Up to that moment his name had not been mentioned, at least officially, in connection with the Blue Diamond. Consequently, I consumed my curiosity in patience. He continued, there is also in Les Temps an interview with my old friend Janimard, according to whom a certain blonde lady, who should be my friend, 
must have murdered the Berlin d'Autrec and tried to rob Madame de Croissant of her famous ring. And what do you think? He accuses me of being the instigator of those crimes. I could not suppress a slight shudder. Was this true? Must I believe that his career of theft, his mode of existence, the logical result of such a life, had drawn that man into more serious crimes, including murder? I looked at him. He was so calm, and his eyes had such a frank expression. I observed his hands. They had been formed from a model of exceeding delicacy, long and slender, inoffensive, truly, and the hands of an artist. "'Janimard has pipe dreams,' I said. "'No, no,' protested Lupin. "'Janimard has some cleverness, and, at times, almost inspiration.' "'Inspiration?' "'Yes. For instance, that interview is a master stroke. "'In the first place, he announces the coming of his English rival "'in order to put me on my guard and make his task more difficult.' In the second place, he indicates the exact point to which he has conducted the affair in order that Sholmes will not get credit for the work already done by Janimard. <laughs> that is good warfare. Whatever it may be, you have two adversaries to deal with, and such adversaries. Oh, one of them doesn't count. And the other? Sholmes? Oh, I confess he is a worthy foe, and that explains my present good humor. In the first place, it is a question of self-esteem. I am pleased to know that they consider me a subject worthy the attention of the celebrated English detective. In the next place, just imagine the pleasure a man such as I must experience in the thought of a duel with Herlock Sholmes. But I shall be obliged to strain every muscle. He is a clever fellow, and will contest every inch of the ground. "'Then you consider him a strong opponent?' "'I do. "'As a detective, I believe he has never had an equal. "'But I have one advantage over him. "'He is making the attack, and I am simply defending myself. "'My role is the easier one. "'Besides, I am familiar with his method of warfare, "'and he does not know mine.' I am prepared to show him a few new tricks that will give him something to think about. He tapped the table with his fingers as he uttered the following sentences, with an air of keen delight. Arsène Lupin against Herlock Sholmes. France against England. Trafalgar will be revenged at last. Ah, the rascal! He doesn't suspect that I am prepared. And a Lupin warned... He stopped suddenly, seized with a fit of coughing, and hid his face in his napkin, as if something had stuck in his throat. "'A bit of bread?' I inquired. "'Drink some water.' "'No, it isn't that,' he replied in a stifled voice. "'Then what is it?' "'The want of air.' "'Do you wish a window opened?' "'No. I shall go out. Give me my hat and overcoat, quick. I must go.' "'What's the matter?' "'The two gentlemen who came in just now. Look at the taller one. "'Now, when we go out, keep to my left, so he will not see me. "'The one who is sitting behind you? "'Yes, I will explain it to you outside. "'Who is it?' "'Herlock Sholmes.' "'He made a desperate effort to control himself, as if he were ashamed of his emotion, "'replaced his napkin, drank a glass of water, and, quite recovered, said to me, smiling, "'It is strange, hey, that I should be affected so easily?' "'But that unexpected sight. "'What have you to fear, since no one can recognize you "'on account of your many transformations? "'Every time I see you, it seems to me your face has changed. "'It's not at all familiar. "'I don't know why.' "'But he would recognize me,' said Lupin. "'He has seen me only once. "'But at that time he made a mental photograph of me. "'Not of my external appearance, but of my very soul. "'Not what I appear to be, but just what I am.' Do you understand? And then, and then, I did not expect to meet him here. Such a strange encounter, in this little restaurant. Well, shall we go out? No, not now, said Lupin. What are you going to do? The better way is to act frankly, to have confidence in him. 
trust him. You will not speak to him. Why not? It will be to my advantage to do so, and find out what he knows, and perhaps what he thinks. At present I have the feeling that his gaze is on my neck and shoulders, and that he is trying to remember where he has seen them before. He reflected a moment. I observed a malicious smile at the corner of his mouth. Then, obedient, I think, to a whim of his impulsive nature, and not to the necessities of the situation, he arose, turned around, and, with a bow and a joyous air, he said, "'By what lucky chance! Ah, I am delighted to see you. Permit me to introduce a friend of mine.' For a moment the Englishman was disconcerted. Then he made a movement as if he would seize Arsène Dupin. The latter shook his head and said, "'That would not be fair. Besides, the movement would be an awkward one and quite useless.' The Englishman looked about him, as if in search of assistance. "'No use,' said Lupin. "'Besides, are you quite sure you can place your hand on me?' "'Come now, show me that you are a real Englishman, and therefore a good sport.' This advice seemed to commend itself to the detective, for he partially rose and said very formally, "'Monsieur Wilson, my friend and assistant?' Monsieur Arsène Lupin. Wilson's amazement evoked a laugh. With bulging eyes and gaping mouth, he looked from one to the other, as if unable to comprehend the situation. Herlock Sholmes laughed and said, <laughs> Wilson, you should conceal your astonishment at an incident which is one of the most natural in the world. Why do you not arrest him? stammered Wilson. Have you not observed, Wilson, that the gentleman is between me and the door? and only a few steps from the door. By the time I could move my little finger, he would be outside. "'Don't let that make any difference,' said Lupin, who now walked around the table and seated himself so that the Englishman was between him and the door, thus placing himself at the mercy of the foreigner. Wilson looked at Sholmes to find out if he had the right to admire this act of wanton courage. The Englishman's face was impenetrable, but a moment later he called, "'Waiter!' When the waiter came, he ordered soda, beer, and whiskey. The treaty of peace was signed, until further orders. In a few moments, the four men were conversing in an apparently friendly manner. Herlock Sholmes is a man such as you might meet every day in the business world. He is about fifty years of age, and looks as if he might have passed his life in an office, adding up columns of dull figures, or writing out formal statements of business accounts. There was nothing to distinguish him from the average citizen of London, except the appearance of his eyes, his terribly keen and penetrating eyes. But then he is Herlock Sholmes, which means that he has a wonderful combination of intuition, observation, clairvoyance, and ingenuity. One could readily believe that nature had been pleased to take the two most extraordinary detectives that the imagination of man has hitherto conceived, the Dupin of Edgar Allan Poe, and the Lecoq of Émile Gaboriau, and, out of that material, constructed a new detective, more extraordinary and supernatural than either of them. And when a person reads the history of his exploits, which have made him famous throughout the entire world, he asks himself whether Herlock Sholmes is not a mythical personage, a fictitious hero born in the brain of a great novelist. Conan Doyle, for instance. When Arsène Lupin questioned him in regard to the length of his sojourn in France, he turned the conversation into its proper channel by saying, "'That depends on you, monsieur.' "'Ho!' Oh, exclaimed Lupin, laughing. "'If it depends on me, you can return to England tonight.' That is a little too soon, but I expect to return in the course of eight or nine days, ten at the outside. Are you in such a hurry? I have many cases to attend to, such as the robbery of the Anglo-Chinese Bank, the abduction of Lady Eccleston. But don't you think, Monsieur Lupin, that I can finish my business in Paris within a week? Certainly, if you confine your efforts to the case of the Blue Diamond. It is, moreover, the length of time that I require to make preparations for my safety, in case the solution of that affair should give you certain dangerous advantages over me. And yet, said the Englishman, I expect to close the business in eight or ten days. And arrest me on the eleventh, perhaps? No, 
The tenth is my limit. Lupin shook his head thoughtfully as he said, mm, That will be difficult, very difficult. Difficult, perhaps, but possible, therefore certain. Absolutely certain, said Wilson, as if he had clearly worked out the long series of operations which would conduct his collaborator to the desired result. Of course, said Herlock Sholmes. I do not hold all the trump cards, as these cases are already several months old, and I lack certain information and clues upon which I am accustomed to base my investigations. Such as spots of mud and cigarette ashes, said Wilson, with an air of importance. In addition to the remarkable conclusions formed by Monsieur Janimard, I have obtained all the articles written on the subject, and have formed a few deductions of my own. Some ideas which were suggested to us by analysis or hypothesis— added Wilson sententiously. "'I wish to inquire,' said Arsène Lupin, in that deferential tone which he employed in speaking to Sholmes, "'would I be indiscreet if I were to ask you what opinion you have formed about the case?' Really, it was a most exciting situation to see those two men facing each other across the table, engaged in an earnest discussion as if they were obliged to solve some abstruse problem or come to an agreement upon some controverted fact.' Wilson was in the seventh heaven of delight. Herlock Sholmes filled his pipe slowly, lighted it, and said, "'This affair is much simpler than it appeared to be at first sight.' "'Much simpler,' said Wilson, as a faithful echo. "'I say this affair, for, in my opinion, there is only one,' said Sholmes. "'The death of the Baron d'Autrec, the story of the ring, and, let us not forget, the mystery of lottery ticket number 514.' are only different phases of one might call the mystery of the blonde lady. Now, according to my view, it is simply a question of discovering the bond that unites those three episodes in the same story, the fact which proves the unity of the three events. Janimard, whose judgment is rather superficial, finds that unity in the faculty of disappearance, that is, in the power of coming and going unseen and unheard. That theory does not satisfy me. "'Well, what is your idea?' asked Lupin. "'In my opinion,' said Sholmes, "'the characteristic feature of the three episodes "'is your design and purpose of leading the affair "'into a certain channel previously chosen by you. "'It is, on your part, more than a plan. "'It is a necessity, an indispensable condition of success. "'Can you furnish any details of your theory?' "'Certainly. "'For example,' From the beginning of your conflict with Monsieur Gerbois, is it not evident that the apartment of Monsieur Detenant is the place selected by you, the inevitable spot where all the parties must meet? In your opinion, it was the only safe place, and you arranged a rendezvous there, publicly, one might say, for the blonde lady and Mademoiselle Gerbois. The professor's daughter, added Wilson. Now, let us consider the case of the blue diamond. Did you try to appropriate it while the Baron d'Autrec possessed it? No. But the Baron takes his brother's house. Six months later, we have the intervention of Antoinette Brehat and the first attempt. The diamond escapes you, and the sale is widely advertised to take place at the Drouot auction rooms. Will it be a free and open sale? Is the richest amateur sure to carry off the jewel? No. Just as the banker Hirschman is on the point of buying the ring— a lady sends him a letter of warning, and it is the Countess de Crosson, prepared and influenced by the same lady, who becomes the purchaser of the diamond. Will the ring disappear at once? No. You lack the opportunity. Therefore you must wait. At last the Countess goes to her chateau. That is what you are waiting for. The ring disappears. To reappear again in the tooth powder of Herr Bleichen, remarked Lupin. "'Oh, such nonsense!' exclaimed Sholmes, striking the table with his fist. "'Don't tell me such a fairy tale. I am too old a fox to be led away by a false scent.' "'What do you mean?' "'What do I mean?' said Sholmes, then paused a moment as if he wished to arrange his effect. At last he said, "'The blue diamond that was found in the tooth powder was false. You kept the genuine stone.' Arsène Lupin remained silent for a moment. Then, with his eyes fixed on the Englishman, he replied calmly, "'You are impertinent, monsieur.' "'Impertinent, indeed,' repeated Wilson, 
beaming with admiration. Yes, said Lupin, and yet, to do you credit, you have thrown a strong light on a very mysterious subject. Not a magistrate, not a special reporter who has been engaged on this case has come so near the truth. It is a marvellous display of intuition and logic. No, oh, a person has simply to use his brains, said Herlock Sholmes, nattered at the homage of the expert criminal. And so few have any brains to use, replied Lupin. And now, that the field of conjectures has been narrowed down, and the rubbish cleared away. Well, now, I have simply to discover why the three episodes were enacted at 25 Rue Clapeyron, 134 Avenue Henri Martin, and within the walls of the Chateau de Croisson, and my work will be finished. What remains will be child's play. Don't you think so? Yes, I think you are right. In that case, Monsieur Lupin, am I wrong in saying that my business will be finished in ten days? "'In ten days you will know the whole truth,' said Lupin. "'And you will be arrested.' "'No. No?' "'In order that I may be arrested, there must occur such a series of improbable and unexpected misfortunes that I cannot admit the possibility of such an event. We have a saying in England that the unexpected always happens.' They looked at each other for a moment, calmly and fearlessly, without any display of bravado or malice. They met as equals, in a contest of wit and skill, and this meeting was the formal crossing of swords, preliminary to the duel. "'Ah!' exclaimed Lupin. "'At last I shall have an adversary worthy of the name, one whose defeat will be the proudest achievement in my career.' "'Are you not afraid?' asked Wilson. "'Almost, Monsieur Wilson,' replied Lupin, rising from his chair. "'And the proof is that I am about to make a hasty retreat. Then we will say ten days, Monsieur Sholmes?' "'Yes, ten days. This is Sunday. A week from next Wednesday, at eight o'clock in the evening, it will be all over.' "'And I shall be in prison?' "'No doubt of it.' Not a pleasant outlook for a man who gets so much enjoyment out of life as I do. No cares, a lively interest in the affairs of the world, a justifiable contempt for the police, and the consoling sympathy of numerous friends and admirers. And now, behold, all that is about to be changed. It is the reverse side of the medal. After sunshine comes the rain. It is no longer a laughing matter. Adieu. Hurry up, said Wilson, full of solicitude for a person in whom Herlock Sholmes had inspired so much respect. Do not lose a minute. Not a minute, Monsieur Wilson. But I wish to express my pleasure at having met you, and to tell you how much I envy the master on having such a valuable assistant as you seem to be. Then, after they had courteously saluted each other, like adversaries in a duel who entertain no feeling of malice but are obliged to fight by force of circumstances, Lupin seized me by the arm and drew me outside. "'What do you think of it, dear boy? The strange events of this evening will form an interesting chapter in the memoirs you are now preparing for me.' He closed the door of the restaurant behind us, and after taking a few steps he stopped and said, "'Do you smoke?' "'No. Nor do you, it seems to me.' "'You are right. I don't.' He lighted a cigarette with a wax match, which he shook several times in an effort to extinguish it. But he threw away the cigarette immediately, ran across the street, and joined two men who emerged from the shadows as if called by a signal. He conversed with them for a few minutes on the opposite sidewalk, and then returned to me. "'I beg your pardon, but I fear that cursed Sholmes is going to give me trouble. But I assure you, he is not yet through with Arsène Lupin. He will find out what kind of fuel I use to warm my blood. And now, au revoir. The genial Wilson is right. There is not a moment to lose. He walked away rapidly. Thus ended the events of that exciting evening, or at least that part of them in which I was a participant. 
subsequently during the course of the evening other stirring incidents occurred which have come to my knowledge through the courtesy of other members of that unique dinner party at the very moment in which lupin left me herlock sholmes rose from the table and looked at his watch mm, twenty minutes to nine at nine o'clock i am to meet the count and countess at the railway station then we must be off exclaimed wilson between two drinks of whiskey they left the restaurant wilson don't look behind we may be followed and in that case let us act as if we did not care wilson i want your opinion why was lupin in that restaurant to get something to eat replied wilson quickly wilson i must congratulate you on the accuracy of your deduction i couldn't have done better myself wilson blushed with pleasure and sholmes continued to get something to eat very well and after that probably to assure himself whether i am going to the chateau de croissant as announced by Janimard in his interview i must go in order not to disappoint him but in order to gain time on him i shall not go ah said wilson nonplused you my friend will walk down the street take a carriage two three carriages return later and get the valises that we left at the station, and make for the Elysee Palace at the gallop. And when I reach the Elysee Palace? Engage a room, go to sleep, and await my orders. Quite proud of the important role assigned to him, Wilson set out to perform his task. Herlock Sholmes proceeded to the railway station, bought a ticket, and repaired to the Amiens Express, in which the Count and Countess de Croisson were already installed. He bowed to them, lighted his pipe, and had a quiet smoke in the corridor. The train started. Ten minutes later he took a seat beside the countess, and said to her, "'Have you the ring here, madam?' "'Yes.' "'Will you kindly let me see it?' He took it and examined it closely. Mm, "'Just as I suspected. It is a manufactured diamond.' "'A manufactured diamond?' "'Yes. A new process, which consists in submitting diamond dust to tremendous heat until it melts and is then moulded into a single stone. But my diamond is genuine. Yes, your diamond is, but this is not yours. Where is mine? It is held by Arsène Lupin. And this stone? Was substituted for yours, and slipped into Herr Bleichen's tooth powder, where it was afterwards found. Then you think this is false? Absolutely false. The countess was overwhelmed with surprise and grief, while her husband scrutinized the diamond with an incredulous air. Finally she stammered, "'Is it possible? And why did they not merely steal it and be done with it? And how did they steal it?' "'That is exactly what I am going to find out.' "'At the Chateau de Croissant?' "'No, I shall leave the train at Creil and return to Paris. It is there the game between me and Arsène Lupin must be played. In fact, the game is commenced already.' and Lupin thinks I'm on my way to the chateau. But— What does it matter to you, madame? The essential thing is your diamond, is it not? Yes. Well, don't worry. I have just undertaken a much more difficult task than that. You have my promise that I will restore the true diamond to you within ten days. The train slackened its speed. He put the false diamond in his pocket and opened the door. The Count cried out, That is the wrong side of the train. You are getting out on the tracks. That is my intention. If Lupin has anyone on my track, he will lose sight of me now. Adieu. An employee protested in vain. After the departure of the train, the Englishman sought the station master's office. Forty minutes later, he leaped into a train that landed him in Paris shortly before midnight. He ran across the platform, entered the lunchroom, made his exit at another door, and jumped into a cab. Driver, Rue Clapeyron. Having reached the conclusion that he was not followed, he stopped the carriage at the end of the street and proceeded to make a careful examination of Monsieur Detenon's house and the two adjoining houses. He made measurements of certain distances and entered the figures in his notebook. Driver, Avenue Henri Martin. At the corner of the avenue and the Rue de la Pompe, he dismissed the carriage, walked down the street to number 134, and performed the same operations in front of the house of the late Baron d'Autrec and the two adjoining houses, measuring the width of their respective façades and calculating the depth of the little gardens that stood in front of them. The avenue was deserted. 
and was very dark under its four rows of trees, between which, at considerable intervals, a few gas lamps struggled in vain to light the deep shadows. One of them threw a dim light over a portion of the house, and Sholmes perceived the to let sign posted on the gate, the neglected walks which encircled the small lawn, and the large bare windows of the vacant house. I suppose, he said to himself, the house has been unoccupied since the death of the baron. Ah, if I could only get in and view the scene of the murder! No sooner did the idea occur to him than he sought to put it in execution. But how could he manage it? He could not climb over the gate, it was too high. So he took from his pocket an electric lantern and a skeleton key which he always carried. Then, to his great surprise, he discovered that the gate was not locked. In fact, it was open about three or four inches. He entered the garden and was careful to leave the gate as he had found it, partly open. But he had not taken many steps from the gate when he stopped. He had seen a light pass one of the windows on the second floor. He saw the light pass a second window and a third, but he saw nothing else, except a silhouette outlined on the walls of the rooms. The light descended to the first floor, and for a long time wandered from room to room. "'Who the deuce is walking at one o'clock in the morning through the house in which the Baron d'Autrec was killed?' Herlock Sholmes asked himself, deeply interested. There was only one way to find out, and that was to enter the house himself. He did not hesitate, but started for the door of the house. However, at the moment when he crossed the streak of gaslight that came from the street lamp, the man must have seen him, for the light in the house was suddenly extinguished, and Herlock Sholmes did not see it again. Softly he tried the door. It was open also. Hearing no sound, he advanced through the hallway, encountered the foot of the stairs, and ascended to the first floor. Here there was the same silence, the same darkness. He entered one of the rooms, and approached a window through which came a feeble light from the outside. On looking through the window he saw the man, who had no doubt descended by another stairway and escaped by another door. The man was threading his way through the shrubbery which bordered the wall that separated the two gardens. "'The deuce!' exclaimed Sholmes. "'He is going to escape!' He hastened down the stairs and leaped over the steps in his eagerness to cut off the man's retreat, but he did not see anyone, and, owing to the darkness, it was several seconds before he was able to distinguish a bulky form moving through the shrubbery. This gave the Englishman food for reflection. Why had the man not made his escape, which he could have done so easily? Had he remained in order to watch the movements of the intruder who had disturbed him in his mysterious work? "'At all events,' concluded Sholmes, "'it is not Lupin. He would be more adroit. It may be one of his men.' For several minutes Herlock Sholmes remained motionless, with his gaze fixed on the adversary who, in his turn, was watching the detective. But as that adversary had become passive, and as the Englishman was not one to consume his time in idle waiting— he examined his revolver to see if it was in good working order, removed his knife from its sheath, and walked toward the enemy with that cool effrontery and scorn of danger for which he had become famous. He heard a clicking sound. It was his adversary preparing his revolver. Herlock Sholmes dashed boldly into the thicket and grappled with his foe. There was a sharp, desperate struggle, in the course of which Sholmes suspected that the man was trying to draw a knife, but the Englishman, believing his antagonist to be an accomplice of Arsène Lupin, and anxious to win the first trick in the game with that redoubtable foe, fought with unusual strength and determination. He hurled his adversary to the ground, held him there with the weight of his body, and gripping him by the throat with one hand, he used his free hand to take out his electric lantern, press the button, and throw the light over the face of his prisoner. "'Wilson!' he exclaimed in amazement. "'Herlock Sholmes!' stammered a weak, stifled voice. For a long time they remained silent, astounded, foolish. The shriek of an automobile rent the air. A slight breeze stirred the leaves. Suddenly Herlock Sholmes seized his friend by the shoulders and shook him violently as he cried, "'What are you doing here? Tell me, what?' "'Did I tell you to hide in the bushes and spy on me?' "'Spy on you?' muttered Wilson. Why, "'Why, I didn't know it was you.' "'But what are you doing here? You ought to be in bed.' "'I was in bed. You ought to be asleep. I was asleep.' "'Well, what brought you here?' asked Sholmes. "'Your letter.' "'My letter? I don't understand.' 
Yes, a, a messenger brought it to me at the hotel. From me? Are you crazy? It is true, I swear it. Where is the letter? Wilson handed him a sheet of paper, which he read by the light of his lantern. It was as follows. Wilson, come at once to Avenue Henri Martin. The house is empty. Inspect the whole place and make an exact plan. Then return to hotel. Herlock Sholmes. I was measuring the rooms, said Wilson, when I saw a shadow in the garden. I had only one idea. That was to seize the shadow. The idea was excellent. But remember this, Wilson, whenever you receive a letter from me, be sure it is my handwriting and not a forgery. Ah! Oh, exclaimed Wilson, as the truth dawned on him. Then the letter wasn't from you. No. Who sent it, then? Arsène Lupin. Why? For what purpose? asked Wilson. I don't know, and that's what worries me. I don't understand why he took the trouble to disturb you. Of course, if he had sent me on such a foolish errand, I wouldn't be surprised. But what was his object in disturbing you? I must hurry back to the hotel. So must I, Wilson. They arrived at the gate. Wilson, who was ahead, took hold of it and pulled. Ah, uh, you closed it? he said. No, I left it partly open. Sholmes tried the gate. Then, alarmed, he examined the lock. An oath escaped him. Good God! It is locked! Locked with a key! He shook the gate with all his strength. Then, realizing the futility of his efforts, he dropped his arms, discouraged, and muttered in a jerky manner, I can see it all now. It is Lupin. He foresaw that I would leave the train at Creil, and he prepared this neat little trap for me in case I should commence my investigation this evening. Moreover, he was kind enough to send me a companion to share my captivity. All done to make me lose a day, and perhaps also to teach me to mind my own business. Do you mean to say we are prisoners? Exactly. Herlock Sholmes and Wilson are the prisoners of Arsène Lupin. It is a bad beginning. But he laughs best who laughs last. Wilson seized Sholmes's arm and exclaimed, Look! Look up there! A light! A light shone through one of the windows of the first floor. Both of them ran to the house, and each ascended by the stairs he had used on coming out a short time before, and they met again at the entrance to the lighted chamber. A small piece of candle was burning in the center of the room. Beside it there was a basket containing a bottle, a roasted chicken, and a loaf of bread. Sholmes was greatly amused, and laughed heartily. <laughs> Wonderful! We are invited to supper! It is really an enchanted place, a genuine fairyland. <laughs> Come, Wilson, cheer up. This is not a funeral. <laughs> it's all very funny. Are you quite sure it is so very funny? asked Wilson, in a lugubrious tone. Am I sure? exclaimed Sholmes, with a gaiety that was too boisterous to be natural. Why, to tell the truth, it's the funniest thing I ever saw. It's a jolly good comedy. <laughs> what a master of sarcasm this Arsène Lupin is. He makes a fool of you with the utmost grace and delicacy. I wouldn't miss this feast for all the money in the Bank of England. Come, Wilson, you grieve me. You should display that nobility of character which rises superior to misfortune. I don't see that you have any cause for complaint. Really, I don't. After a time, by dint of good humor and sarcasm, he managed to restore Wilson to his normal mood, and make him swallow a morsel of chicken and a glass of wine. But when the candle went out and they prepared to spend the night there, with the bare floor for a mattress and the hard wall for a pillow, the harsh and ridiculous side of the situation was impressed upon them. That particular incident will not form a pleasant page in the memoirs of the famous detective. Next morning Wilson awoke, stiff and cold. A slight noise attracted his attention. Herlock Sholmes was kneeling on the floor, critically examining some grains of sand and studying some chalk marks, now almost defaced, which formed certain figures and numbers, which figures he entered in his notebook. Accompanied by Wilson, who was deeply interested in the work, he examined each room, and found similar chalk marks in two other apartments. He noticed also two circles on the oaken panels, an arrow on a wainscot, and four figures on four steps of the stairs. At the end of an hour Wilson said, 
The figures are correct, aren't they? I don't know. But, at all events, they mean something, replied Sholmes, who had forgotten the discomforts of the night and the joy created by his new discoveries. It is quite obvious, said Wilson. They represent the number of pieces in the floor. Ah! Yes, and the two circles indicate that the panels are false, as you can readily ascertain, and the arrow points in the direction in which the panels move. Herlock Sholmes looked at Wilson in astonishment. Ah, oh, my dear friend, how do you know all that? Your clairvoyance makes my poor ability in that direction look quite insignificant. Oh, it is very simple, said Wilson, inflated with pride. I examined those marks last night, according to your instructions, or rather, according to the instructions of Arsène Lupin, since he wrote the letter you sent to me. At that moment, Wilson faced a greater danger than he had during his struggle in the garden with Herlock Sholmes. The latter now felt the furious desire to strangle him. But, dominating his feelings, Sholmes made a grimace which was intended for a smile, and said, "'Quite so, Wilson. You have done well. And your work shows commendable progress. But, tell me, have you exercised your powers of observation and analysis on any other points? I might profit by your deductions.' "'Oh, no, I went no farther.' "'That's a pity. Your debut was such a promising one. But since that is all, we may as well go.' "'Go? But how can we get out?' "'The way all honest people go out, through the gate.' "'But it is locked.' "'It will be opened.' "'By whom?' "'Please call the two policemen who are strolling down the avenue.' "'But—' "'But what?' It is very humiliating. What will be said when it becomes known that Herlock Sholmes and Wilson were the prisoners of Arsène Lupin? Well, of course, I understand they will roar with laughter, replied Herlock Sholmes, in a dry voice and with frowning features. But we can't set up housekeeping in this place. And you will not try to find another way out? No. But— the man who brought us the basket of provisions did not cross the garden, coming or going. There is some other way out. Let us look for it and not bother with the police. Your argument is sound, but you forget that all the detectives in Paris have been trying to find it for the last six months, and that I searched the house from top to bottom while you were asleep. Ah, my dear Wilson, we have not been accustomed to pursue such game as Arsène Lupin. He leaves no trail behind him. At eleven o'clock, Herlock Sholmes and Wilson were liberated, and conducted to the nearest police station, where the commissary, after subjecting them to a severe examination, released them with an affectation of good will that was quite exasperating. "'I am very sorry, messieurs, that this unfortunate incident has occurred. You will have a very poor opinion of French hospitality. <laughs> Mon Dieu, what a night you must have passed! Ah, that rascally Lupin is no respecter of persons!' They took a carriage to their hotel. At the office, Wilson asked for the key of his room. After some search, the clerk replied, much astonished, "'But, monsieur, you have given up the room.' "'I gave it up? When?' "'This morning, by the letter your friend brought here.' "'What friend?' Uh, "'The gentleman who brought your letter. Ah, your card is still attached to the letter. Here they are.' Wilson looked at them. Certainly it was one of his cards.' and the letter was in his handwriting. "'Good Lord!' he muttered. "'This is another of his tricks!' And he added aloud, "'Where is my luggage?' "'Your friend took it.' "'Ah! And you gave it to him?' "'Certainly. On the strength of your letter and card.' "'Of course. Of course.' They left the hotel and walked, slowly and thoughtfully, through the Champs-Élysées. The avenue was bright and cheerful beneath a clear autumn sun. The air was mild and pleasant. At Rond Pointe, Herlock Sholmes lighted his pipe. Then Wilson spoke. "'I can't understand you, Sholmes. You are so calm and unruffled. They play with you as a cat plays with a mouse, and yet you do not say a word.' Sholmes stopped as he replied. "'Wilson, I was thinking of your card.' "'Well, the point is this. Here is a man who, in view of a possible struggle with us, procures specimens of our handwriting, and who holds in his possession one or more of your cards. 
now have you considered how much precaution and skill those facts represent well well wilson to overcome an enemy so well prepared and so thoroughly equipped requires the infinite shrewdness of of a herlock sholmes and yet as you have seen wilson i have lost the first round at six o'clock the echo de france published the following article in its evening edition this morning monsieur thenard commissary of police in the sixteenth district released herlock sholmes and his friend wilson both of whom had been locked in the house of the late baron d'autrec where they spent a very pleasant night thanks to the thoughtful care and attention of arsene lupin in addition to their other troubles these gentlemen have been robbed of their valises and in consequence thereof they have entered a formal complaint against arsene lupin arsene lupin satisfied that he has given them a mild reproof hopes these gentlemen will not force him to resort to more stringent measures bah exclaimed herlock sholmes crushing the paper in his hands that is only child's play and that is the only criticism i have to make of arsene lupin he plays to the gallery there is that much of the fake here in him ah sholmes you are a wonderful man you have such a command over your temper nothing ever disturbs you no nothing disturbs me replied sholmes in a voice that trembled from rage besides what's the use of losing my temper i am quite confident of the final result i shall have the last word end of chapter three Chapter Four of Arsène Lupin vs. Herlock Sholmes by Maurice Leblanc, translated by George Moorhead. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Light in the Darkness. However well-tempered a man's character may be, and Herlock Sholmes is one of those men over whom ill fortune has little or no hold, there are circumstances wherein the most courageous combatant feels the necessity of marshalling his forces before risking the chances of a battle. I shall take a vacation today, said Sholmes. And what shall I do? asked Wilson. You, Wilson, let me see. You can buy some underwear and linen to replenish our wardrobe while I take a rest. Very well, Sholmes. I will watch while you sleep. Wilson uttered these words with all the importance of a sentinel on guard at the outpost, and therefore exposed to the greatest danger. His chest was expanded, his muscles were tense. Assuming a shrewd look, he scrutinized, officially, the little room in which they had fixed their abode. "'Very well, Wilson, you can watch. I shall occupy myself in the preparation of a line of attack more appropriate to the methods of the enemy we are called upon to meet. Do you see, Wilson, we have been deceived in this fellow Lupin? My opinion is that we must commence at the very beginning of this affair.' "'And even before that, if possible.' but have we sufficient time nine days dear boy that is five too many the englishman spent the entire afternoon in smoking and sleeping he did not enter upon his new plan of attack until the following day then he said wilson i am ready let us attack the enemy lead on macduff exclaimed wilson full of martial ardor i wish to fight in the front rank oh have no fear i shall do credit to my king and country for i am an englishman in the first place sholmes had three long and important interviews with monsieur detenon whose rooms he examined with the greatest care and precision with suzanne gerbois whom he questioned in regard to the blonde lady and with sister auguste who had retired to the convent of the visitandines since the murder of baron d'autrec at each of these interviews wilson had remained outside and each time he asked satisfactory quite so i was sure we were on the right track they paid a visit to the two houses adjoining that of the late baron d'autrec in the avenue henri martin then they visited the rue clapeyron and while he was examining the front of number twenty five sholmes said all these houses must be connected by secret passages but i can't find them for the first time in his life wilson doubted the omnipotence of his famous associate why did he now talk so much and accomplish so little why exclaimed sholmes in answer to wilson's secret thought because with this fellow lupin a person has to work in the dark 
and instead of deducting the truth from established facts, a man must extract it from his own brain, and afterward learn if it is supported by the facts in the case. But what about the secret passages? They must exist. But even though I should discover them, and thus learn how Arsène Lupin made his entrance to the lawyer's house, and how the blonde lady escaped from the house of Baron d'Autrec after the murder, what good would it do? How would it help me? How would it furnish me with a weapon of attack? "'Let us attack him just the same!' exclaimed Wilson, who had scarcely uttered these words when he jumped back with a cry of alarm. Something had fallen at their feet. It was a bag filled with sand which might have caused them serious injury if it had struck them. Sholmes looked up. Some men were working on a scaffolding attached to the balcony at the fifth floor of the house. He said, "'We were lucky. One step more and that heavy bag would have fallen on our heads. I wonder if—' Moved by a sudden impulse, he rushed into the house, up the five flights of stairs, rang the bell, pushed his way into the apartment to the great surprise and alarm of the servant who came to the door, and made his way to the balcony in front of the house. But there was no one there. "'Where are the workmen who were here a moment ago?' he asked the servant. Well, "'They have just gone.' "'Which way did they go?' "'By the servant's stairs.' Sholmes leaned out of the window. He saw two men leaving the house, carrying bicycles. They mounted them and quickly disappeared around the corner. "'How long have they been working on the scaffolding?' "'Those men? Only since this morning. It is their first day.' Sholmes returned to the street and joined Wilson. Together they returned to the hotel, and thus the second day ended in a mournful silence. On the following day their program was almost similar. They sat together on a bench in the Avenue Henri Martin, much to Wilson's disgust, who did not find it amusing to spend long hours watching the house in which the tragedy had occurred. "'What do you expect, Sholmes? That Arsène Lupin will walk out of the house?' "'No.' "'That the blonde lady will make her appearance?' "'No.' "'What, then?' "'I am looking for something to occur, some slight incident that will furnish me with a clue to work on.' "'And if it does not occur?' "'Then I must myself create the spark that will set fire to the powder. "'A solitary incident, and that of a disagreeable nature, broke the monotony of the forenoon. "'A gentleman was riding along the avenue when his horse suddenly turned aside in such a manner "'that it ran against the bench on which they were sitting, and struck Sholmes a slight blow on the shoulder. "'Ha!' exclaimed Sholmes. "'A little more, and I would have had a broken shoulder!' The gentleman struggled with his horse. The Englishman drew his revolver and pointed it, but Wilson seized his arm and said, "'Don't be foolish! What are you going to do? Kill the man?' "'Leave me alone, Wilson! Let go!' During the brief struggle between Sholmes and Wilson, the stranger rode away. "'Now you can shoot!' said Wilson triumphantly, when the horseman was at some distance. "'Wilson, you're an idiot! Don't you understand that the man is an accomplice of Arsène Lupin?' Sholmes was trembling from rage. Wilson stammered pitifully, "'But, uh, that man, uh, an accomplice?' "'Yes, the same as the workman who tried to drop the bag of sand on us yesterday. It can't be possible.' "'Possible or not, there was only one way to prove it.' "'By killing the man?' "'No, by killing the horse. If you hadn't grabbed my arm, I should have captured one of Lupin's accomplices. Now do you understand the folly of your act?' Throughout the afternoon, both men were morose. They did not speak a word to each other. At five o'clock, they visited the Rue Clapeyron, but were careful to keep at a safe distance from the houses. However, three young men who were passing through the street, arm in arm, singing, ran against Sholmes and Wilson and refused to let them pass. Sholmes, who was in an ill humor, contested the right of way with them. After a brief struggle, Sholmes resorted to his fists. He struck one of the men a hard blow on the chest, another a blow in the face, and thus subdued two of his adversaries. Thereupon the three of them took to their heels and disappeared. "'Ah!' exclaimed Sholmes. "'That does me good. I needed a little exercise.' But Wilson was leaning against the wall. Sholmes said, "'What's the matter, old chap? You're quite pale.' Wilson pointed to his left arm, which hung inert, and stammered, "'I don't know what it is. My arm pains me.' "'Very much. Is it serious?' "'Yes, I'm afraid so.' He tried to raise his arm, but it was helpless. Sholmes felt it, gently at first, then in a rougher way, 
to see how badly it was hurt, he said. He concluded that Wilson was really hurt, so he led him to a neighboring pharmacy, where a closer examination revealed the fact that the arm was broken and that Wilson was a candidate for the hospital. In the meantime, they bared his arm and applied some remedies to ease his suffering. "'Come, come, old chap, cheer up,' said Sholmes, who was holding Wilson's arm. "'In five or six weeks you'll be all right again. But I will pay them back, the rascals. Especially Lupin, for this is his work. No doubt of that. I swear to you, if ever—' He stopped suddenly, dropped the arm, which caused Wilson such an access of pain that he almost fainted, and, striking his forehead, Sholmes said, "'Wilson, I have an idea!' "'You know, I have one occasionally.' He stood for a moment, silent, with staring eyes, and then muttered in short, sharp phrases, "'Yes, that's it. That would explain all. Right at my feet. And I didn't see it. Ah, parbleu! I should have thought of it before. Wilson, I shall have good news for you.' Abruptly leaving his old friend, Sholmes ran into the street and went directly to the house known as Number 25. On one of the stones to the right of the door, he read this inscription— Destange, architect, 1875. There was a similar inscription on the house numbered 23. Of course, there was nothing unusual in that, but what might be read on the houses in the Avenue Henri Martin? A carriage was passing. He engaged it and directed the driver to take him to number 134 Avenue Henri Martin. He was roused to a high pitch of excitement. He stood up in the carriage and urged the horse to greater speed. He offered extra pourboise to the driver. Quicker! quicker how great was his anxiety as they turned from the rue de la pompe had he caught a glimpse of the truth at last on one of the stones of the late baron's house he read the words destange architect eighteen seventy four and a similar inscription appeared on the two adjoining houses the reaction was such that he settled down in the seat of the carriage trembling from joy at last a tiny ray of light had penetrated the dark shadows which encompassed these mysterious crimes. In the vast sombre forest wherein a thousand pathways crossed and recrossed, he had discovered the first clue to the track followed by the enemy. He entered a branch post office and obtained telephonic connection with the Chateau de Crozon. The Countess answered the telephone call. "'Hello. Is that you, madame?' "'Monsieur Sholmes, isn't it?' "'Everything going all right?' "'Quite well, but I wish to ask you one question.' "'Hello?' "'Yes, I hear you.' "'Tell me, when was the Chateau de Crosson built?' "'It was destroyed by fire and rebuilt about thirty years ago.' "'Who built it, and in what year?' "'There is an inscription on the front of the house which reads, "'Lucien Destange, Architect, 1877.' "'Thank you, madame, that is all. Good-bye.' He went away murmuring, Destange, Lucien Destange, that name has a familiar sound. He noticed a public reading room, entered, consulted a dictionary of modern biography, and copied the following information. Lucien Destange, born 1840, Grand Prix de Rome, officer of the Legion of Honor, author of several valuable books on architecture, etc. Then he returned to the pharmacy and found that Wilson had been taken to the hospital. There Sholmes found him with his arm in splints, and shivering with fever. "'Victory! Victory!' cried Sholmes. "'I hold one end of the thread.' "'Of what thread?' "'The one that leads to victory. I shall now be walking on solid ground, where there will be footprints, clues—' "'Cigarette ashes?' asked Wilson, whose curiosity had overcome his pain. "'And many other things. Just think, Wilson.' I have found the mysterious link which unites the different adventures in which the blonde lady played a part. Why did Lupin select those three houses for the scenes of his exploits? Yes, why? Because those three houses were built by the same architect. That was an easy problem, eh? Of course. But who would have thought of it? No one but you. And who, except I, knows that the same architect, by the use of analogous plans, has rendered it possible for a person to execute three distinct acts which, though miraculous in appearance, are in reality quite simple and easy. That was a stroke of good luck. And it was time, dear boy, as I was becoming very impatient. You know this is our fourth day. Out of ten. Oh, 
after this sholmes was excited delighted and gayer than usual and when i think that these rascals might have attacked me in the street and broken my arm just as they did yours isn't that so wilson wilson simply shivered at the horrible thought sholmes continued we must profit by the lesson i can see wilson that we were wrong to try and fight lupin in the open and leave ourselves exposed to his attacks i can see it and feel it too in my broken arm said wilson you have one consolation wilson that is that i escaped now i must be doubly cautious in an open fight he will defeat me but if i can work in the dark unseen by him i have the advantage no matter how strong his forces may be ganimard might be of some assistance never on the day that i can truly say arsene lupin is there i show you the quarry and how to catch it i shall go and see ganimard at one of the two addresses that he gave me his residence in the rue pergolese or at the swiss tavern in the place du chatelet but until that time i shall work alone he approached the bed placed his hand on wilson's shoulder on the sore one of course and said to him take care of yourself old fellow henceforth your role will be to keep two or three of arsene lupin's men busy watching here in vain for my return to inquire about your health it is a secret mission for you eh yes and i shall do my best to fulfil it conscientiously then you do not expect to come here any more what for asked sholmes i don't know of course i am getting on as well as possible but herlock do me a last service give me a drink a drink yes i am dying of thirst and with my fever to be sure directly he made a pretence of getting some water perceived the package of tobacco lighted his pipe and then as if he had not heard his friend's request he went away whilst wilson uttered a mute prayer for the inaccessible water monsieur destange the servant eyed from head to foot the person to whom he had opened the door of the house the magnificent house that stood at the corner of the place malcherbes and the rue montchanin and at the sight of the man with grey hairs badly shaved dressed in a shabby black coat with a body as ill-formed and ungracious as his face he replied with the disdain which he thought the occasion warranted monsieur destange may or may not be at home that depends has monsieur a card monsieur did not have a card but he had a letter of introduction and after the servant had taken the letter to monsieur destange he was conducted into the presence of that gentleman who was sitting in a large circular room or rotunda which occupied one of the wings of the house it was a library and contained a profusion of books and architectural drawings when the stranger entered the architect said to him you are monsieur stickman yes monsieur my secretary tells me that he is ill and has sent you to continue the general catalogue of the books which he commenced under my direction and more particularly the catalogue of german books are you familiar with that kind of work yes monsieur quite so he replied with a strong german accent under those circumstances the bargain was soon concluded and monsieur destange commenced work with his new secretary herlock sholmes had gained access to the house in order to escape the vigilance of arsene lupin and gain admittance to the house occupied by lucien destange and his daughter clotilde the famous detective had been compelled to resort to a number of stratagems and under a variety of names to ingratiate himself into the good graces and confidence of a number of persons in short to live during forty-eight hours a most complicated life during that time he had acquired the following information m destange having retired from active business on account of his failing health now lived amongst the many books he had accumulated on the subject of architecture he derived infinite pleasure in viewing and handling those dusty old volumes his daughter clotilde was considered eccentric she passed her time in another part of the house and never went out of course Sholmes said to himself, as he wrote in a register the titles of the books which M. Destange dictated to him, "'All that is vague and incomplete, but it is quite a long step in advance. I shall surely solve one of these absorbing problems, 
"'Is Monsieur Destange associated with Arsène Lupin? "'Does he continue to see him? "'Are the papers relating to the construction of the three houses still in existence? "'Will those papers not furnish me with the location of other houses of similar construction, "'which Arsène Lupin and his associates will plunder in the future? "'Monsieur Destange, an accomplice of Arsène Lupin, "'that venerable man, an officer of the Legion of Honour, "'working in league with a burglar!' Such an idea was absurd. Besides, if we concede that such a complicity exists, how could Monsieur Destange, thirty years ago, have possibly foreseen the thefts of Arsène Lupin, who was then an infant? No matter. The Englishman was implacable. With his marvellous scent and that instinct which never fails him, he felt that he was in the heart of some strange mystery. Ever since he first entered the house, he had been under the influence of that impression, and yet he could not define the grounds on which he based his suspicions. Up to the morning of the second day he had not made any significant discovery. At two o'clock of that day he saw Clotilde Destange for the first time. She came to the library in search of a book. She was about thirty years of age, a brunette, slow and silent in her movements, with features imbued with that expression of indifference which is characteristic of people who live a secluded life. She exchanged a few words with her father, and then retired, without even looking at Sholmes. The afternoon dragged along monotonously. At five o'clock, Monsieur Destange announced his intention to go out. Sholmes was alone on the circular gallery that was constructed about ten feet above the floor of the rotunda. It was almost dark. He was on the point of going out, when he heard a slight sound, and, at the same time, experienced the feeling that there was someone in the room. Several minutes passed before he saw or heard anything more. Then he shuddered. A shadowy form emerged from the gloom, quite close to him, upon the balcony. It seemed incredible. How long had this mysterious visitor been there? Whence did he come? The strange man descended the steps and went directly to a large oaken cupboard, Sholmes was a keen observer of the man's movements. He watched him searching amongst the papers with which the cupboard was filled. What was he looking for? Then the door opened and Mademoiselle Destange entered, speaking to someone who was following her. "'So you have decided not to go out, father? Then I will make a light. One second. Do not move.' The strange man closed the cupboard and hid in the embrasure of a large window, drawing the curtains together. Did Mademoiselle Destange not see him? Did she not hear him? Calmly she turned on the electric lights. She and her father sat down close to each other. She opened a book she had brought with her, and commenced to read. After the lapse of a few minutes, she said, "'Your secretary has gone?' "'Yes. I don't see him.' "'Do you like him as well as you did at first? she asked, as if she were not aware of the illness of the real secretary and his replacement by Stickman. "'Oh, yes!' Monsieur Destange's head bobbed from one side to the other. He was asleep. The girl resumed her reading. A moment later, one of the window curtains was pushed back, and the strange man emerged and glided along the wall toward the door, which obliged him to pass behind Monsieur Destange, but in front of Clotilde, and brought him into the light so that Herlock Sholmes obtained a good view of the man's face. It was Arsène Lupin. The Englishman was delighted. His forecast was verified. He had penetrated to the very heart of the mystery, and found Arsène Lupin to be the moving spirit in it. Clotilde had not yet displayed any knowledge of his presence, although it was quite improbable that any movement of the intruder had escaped her notice. Lupin had almost reached the door, and, in fact, his hand was already seeking the doorknob, when his coat brushed against a small table and knocked something to the floor. Monsieur Destange awoke with a start. Arsène Lupin was already standing in front of him, hat in hand, smiling. "'Maxime Bermond!' exclaimed M. Destange joyfully. "'My dear Maxime, what lucky chance brings you here?' "'The wish to see you and Mademoiselle Destange.' "'When did you return from your journey?' "'Yesterday.' "'You must stay to dinner.' "'No, thank you. I am sorry.' "'but I have an appointment to dine with some friends at a restaurant. "'Come to-morrow, then, Clotilde. "'You must urge him to come to-morrow. "'Ah, my dear Maxime, I thought of you many times during your absence.' "'Really?' "'Yes. I went through all my old papers in that cupboard, 
and found our last statement of account. What account? Relating to the Avenue Henri Martin. Ah, do you keep such papers? What for? Then the three of them left the room, and continued their conversation in a small parlor which adjoined the library. Is it Lupin? Sholmes asked himself, in a sudden access of doubt. Certainly, from all appearances, it was he, and yet it was also someone else who resembled Arsène Lupin in certain respects, and who still maintained his own individuality, features, and color of hair. Sholmes could hear Lupin's voice in the adjoining room. He was relating some stories at which Monsieur Destange laughed heartily, and which even brought a smile to the lips of the melancholy Clotilde. And each of those smiles appeared to be the reward which Arsène Lupin was seeking, and which he was delighted to have secured. His success caused him to redouble his efforts, and insensibly, at the sound of that clear and happy voice, Clotilde's face brightened and lost that cold and listless expression which usually pervaded it. "'They love each other,' thought Sholmes. "'But what the deuce can there be in common between Clotilde Destange and Maxime Bermond? Does she know that Maxime is none other than Arsène Lupin?' Until seven o'clock, Sholmes was an anxious listener, seeking to profit by the conversation. Then, with infinite precaution, he descended from the gallery, crept along the side of the room to the door in such a manner that the people in the adjoining room did not see him. When he reached the street, Sholmes satisfied himself that there was neither an automobile nor a cab waiting there. Then he slowly limped along the boulevard Malcherbes. He turned into an adjacent street, donned the overcoat which he had carried on his arm, altered the shape of his hat, assumed an upright carriage, and, thus transformed, returned to a place whence he could watch the door of Monsieur Destange's house. In a few minutes Arsène Lupin came out, and proceeded to walk toward the centre of Paris by way of the Rues de Constantinople and London. Herlock Sholmes followed at a distance of a hundred paces. Exciting moments for the Englishman. He sniffed the air eagerly, like a hound following a fresh scent. It seemed to him a delightful thing thus to follow his adversary. It was no longer Herlock Sholmes who was being watched, but Arsène Lupin, the invisible Arsène Lupin. He held him, so to speak, within the grasp of his eye, by an imperceptible bond that nothing could break, and he was pleased to think that the quarry belonged to him. But he soon observed a suspicious circumstance. In the intervening space between him and Arsène Lupin, he noticed several people travelling in the same direction, particularly two husky fellows in slouch hats on the left side of the street, and two others on the right wearing caps and smoking cigarettes. Of course, their presence in that vicinity may have been the result of chance, but Sholmes was more astonished when he observed that the four men stopped when Lupin entered a tobacco shop, and still more surprised when the four men started again after Lupin emerged from the shop, each keeping to his own side of the street. "'Curse it!' muttered Sholmes. "'He is being followed.' He was annoyed at the idea that others were on the trail of Arsène Lupin, that someone might deprive him, not of the glory, he cared little for that, but of the immense pleasure of capturing single-handed the most formidable enemy he had ever met. And he felt that he was not mistaken. The men presented to Sholmes's experienced eye the appearance and manner of those who, while regulating their gait to that of another, wished to present a careless and natural air. "'Is this son of Janimard's work?' muttered Sholmes. "'Is he playing me false?' He felt inclined to speak to one of the men with a view of acting in concert with him, but as they were now approaching the boulevard the crowd was becoming denser, and he was afraid he might lose sight of Lupin. So he quickened his pace and turned into the boulevard just in time to see Lupin ascending the steps of the Hungarian restaurant at the corner of the Rue de Helder. The door of the restaurant was open, so that Sholmes, while sitting on a bench on the other side of the boulevard, could see Lupin take a seat at a table, luxuriously appointed and decorated with flowers, at which three gentlemen and two ladies of elegant appearance were already seated, and who extended to Lupin a hearty greeting. Sholmes now looked about for the four men, and perceived them amongst a crowd of people who were listening to a gypsy orchestra that was playing in a neighboring café. It was a curious thing that they were paying no attention to Arsène Lupin, but seemed to be friendly with the people around them. One of them took a cigarette from his pocket and approached a gentleman who wore a frock coat and silk hat. The gentleman offered the other his cigar for a light, 
and Sholmes had the impression that they talked to each other much longer than the occasion demanded. Finally, the gentleman approached the Hungarian restaurant, entered, and looked around. When he caught sight of Lupin, he advanced and spoke to him for a moment, then took a seat at an adjoining table. Sholmes now recognized this gentleman as the horseman who had tried to run him down in the Avenue Henri Martin. Then Sholmes understood that these men were not tracking Arsène Lupin. They were a part of his band. They were watching over his safety. They were his bodyguard, his satellites, his vigilant escort. Wherever danger threatened Lupin, these confederates were at hand to avert it, ready to defend him. The four men were accomplices. The gentleman in the frock coat was an accomplice. These facts furnished the Englishman with food for reflection. Would he ever succeed in capturing that inaccessible individual? What unlimited power was possessed by such an organization, directed by such a chief? He tore a leaf from his notebook, wrote a few lines in pencil, which he placed in an envelope, and said to a boy about fifteen years of age who was sitting on the bench beside him, "'Here, my boy, take a carriage and deliver this letter to the cashier of the Suisse Tavern, Place du Châtelet. Be quick.' He gave him a five-franc piece. The boy disappeared. A half-hour passed away. The crowd had grown larger, and Sholmes perceived only at intervals the accomplices of Arsène Lupin. Then someone brushed against him and whispered in his ear, "'Well, what is it, Monsieur Sholmes?' "'Ah, it is you, Janimard. "'Yes, I received your note at the tavern. What's the matter?' "'He is there.' "'What do you mean?' "'There, in the restaurant. Lean to the right. Do you see him now?' "'No.' He is pouring a glass of champagne for the lady. That is not Lupin. Yes, it is. But I tell you... Ah, oh, yet it may be. It looks a great deal like him, said Janimard naively. And the others? Accomplices? No. The lady sitting beside him is Lady Cliveden. The other is the Duchess de Cleve. The gentleman sitting opposite Lupin is the Spanish ambassador to London. Janimard took a step forward. Sholmes retained him. Be prudent. You are alone. So is he. No. He has a number of men on the boulevard mounting guard. And inside the restaurant, that gentleman. And I, when I take Arsène Lupin by the collar and announce his name, I shall have the entire room on my side and all the waiters. I should prefer to have a few policemen. But, Monsieur Sholmes, we have no choice. We must catch him when we can. He was right. Sholmes knew it. It was better to take advantage of the opportunity and make the attempt. Sholmes simply gave this advice to Janimard. Conceal your identity as long as possible. Sholmes glided behind a newspaper kiosk, whence he could still watch Lupin, who was leaning toward Lady Cliveden, talking and smiling. Janimard crossed the street, hands in his pockets, as if he were going down the boulevard. But when he reached the opposite sidewalk, he turned quickly and bounded up the steps of the restaurant. There was a shrill whistle. Janimard ran against the head waiter, who had suddenly planted himself in the doorway, and now pushed Janimard back with a show of indignation, as if he were an intruder whose presence would bring disgrace upon the restaurant. Janimard was surprised. At the same moment, the gentleman in the frock coat came out. He took the part of the detective and entered into an exciting argument with the waiter. Both of them hung on to Janimard, one pushing him in, the other pushing him out, in such a manner that, despite all his efforts and despite his furious protestations, the unfortunate detective soon found himself on the sidewalk. The struggling men were surrounded by a crowd. Two policemen, attracted by the noise, tried to force their way through the crowd, but encountered a mysterious resistance and could make no headway through the opposing backs and pressing shoulders of the mob. But suddenly, as if by magic, the crowd parted and the passage to the restaurant was clear. The head waiter, recognizing his mistake, was profuse in his apologies. The gentleman in the frock coat ceased his efforts on behalf of the detective, the crowd dispersed, the policemen passed on, and Janimard hastened to the table at which the six guests were sitting. But now there were only five. He looked around. The only exit was the door. "'The person who was sitting here!' he cried to the five astonished guests. "'Where is he?' "'Monsieur Destro?' "'No, Arsène Lupin!' A waiter approached and said, 
the gentleman went upstairs. Jeanimard rushed up in the hope of finding him. The upper floor of the restaurant contained private dining rooms and had a private stairway leading to the boulevard. No use looking for him now, muttered Jeanimard. He is far away by this time. He was not far away. Two hundred yards at most, in the Madeleine Bastille omnibus, which was rolling along very peacefully with its three horses across the Place de l'Opera toward the Boulevard des Capucins. Two sturdy fellows were talking together on the platform. On the roof of the omnibus, near the stairs, an old fellow was sleeping. It was Herlock Sholmes. With bobbing head, rocked by the movement of the vehicle, the Englishman said to himself, "'If Wilson could see me now, how proud he would be of his collaborator! Bah! It was easy to foresee that the game was lost as soon as the man whistled. Nothing could be done but watch the exits and see that our man did not escape. Really, Lupin makes life exciting and interesting. At the terminal point, Herlock Sholmes, by leaning over, saw Arsène Lupin leaving the omnibus, and as he passed in front of the men who formed his bodyguard, Sholmes heard him say, À l'étoile. À l'étoile, exactly, a rendezvous. I shall be there thought Sholmes. I will follow the two men. Lupin took an automobile, but the men walked the entire distance, followed by Sholmes. They stopped at a narrow house, number 40, Rue Chalgrin, and rang the bell. Sholmes took his position in the shadow of a doorway, whence he could watch the house in question. A man opened one of the windows of the ground floor and closed the shutters, but the shutters did not reach to the top of the window. The impost was clear. At the end of ten minutes, a gentleman rang at the same door, and a few minutes later another man came. A short time afterward, an automobile stopped in front of the house, bringing two passengers, Arsène Lupin and a lady concealed beneath a large cloak and a thick veil. "'The blonde lady, no doubt,' said Sholmes to himself, as the automobile drove away. Herlock Sholmes now approached the house climbed to the window-ledge, and, by standing on tiptoe, he was able to see through the window above the shutters. What did he see? Arsène Lupin, leaning against the mantel, was speaking with considerable animation. The others were grouped around him, listening to him attentively. Amongst them, Sholmes easily recognized the gentleman in the frock-coat, and he thought one of the other men resembled the head waiter of the restaurant. As to the blonde lady, she was seated in an armchair with her back to the window. They are holding a consultation, thought Sholmes. They are worried over the incident at the restaurant and are holding a council of war. Ah, what a master stroke it would be to capture all of them at one fell stroke. One of them having moved toward the door, Sholmes leaped to the ground and concealed himself in the shadow. The gentleman in the frock coat and the head waiter left the house. A moment later, a light appeared at the windows of the first floor but the shutters were closed immediately, and the upper part of the house was dark as well as the lower. "'Lupin and the woman are on the ground floor. The two confederates live on the upper floor,' said Sholmes. Sholmes remained there the greater part of the night, fearing that if he went away Arsène Lupin might leave during his absence. At four o'clock, seeing two policemen at the end of the street, he approached them, explained the situation, and left them to watch the house.' He went to Janimard's residence in the Rue Pergolese and awakened him. "'I have him yet,' said Sholmes. "'Arsène Lupin?' "'Yes.' "'If you haven't got any better hold on him than you had a while ago, I might as well go back to bed. But we may as well go to the station-house.' They went to the police station in the Rue Mesnil, and from there to the residence of the commissary, Monsieur de Cointre. Then, accompanied by half a dozen policemen, they went to the Rue Chalgrin. "'Anything new?' asked Sholmes, addressing the two policemen. "'Nothing.' It was just breaking day when, after taking necessary measures to prevent escape, the commissary rang the bell and commenced to question the concierge. The woman was greatly frightened at this early morning invasion, and she trembled as she replied that there were no tenants on the ground floor. "'What? Not a tenant?' exclaimed Janimard. "'No?' But on the first floor there are two men named Leroux. They have furnished the apartment on the ground floor for some country relations. A gentleman and lady? Yes. Who came here last night? Perhaps, but I don't know. I was asleep. But I don't think so, for the key is here. They did not ask for it. 
With that key, the commissary opened the door of the ground-floor apartment. It comprised only two rooms, and they were empty. "'Impossible!' exclaimed Sholmes. "'I saw both of them in this room.' "'I don't doubt your word,' said the commissary. "'But they are not here now. "'Let us go to the first floor. "'They must be there. "'The first floor is occupied by two men named Leroux. "'We will examine the messieurs Leroux.' They all ascended the stairs, and the commissary rang. At the second ring, a man opened the door. He was in his shirt-sleeves. Sholmes recognized him as one of Lupin's bodyguard. The man assumed a furious air. "'What do you mean by making such a row at this hour of the morning, waking people up?' But he stopped suddenly, astounded. "'God forgive me. Really, gentlemen, I didn't notice who it was. Why, it is Monsieur de Contre, and you, Monsieur Janimard. What can I do for you? Janimard burst into an uncontrollable fit of laughter, which caused him to bend double and turn black in the face. <laughs> oh, it is you, Leroux, he stammered. Oh, this is too funny. <laughs> Leroux, an accomplice of Arsène Lupin. <laughs> oh, I shall die. And your brother, Leroux, where is he? Edmond, called the man. It is Janimard who has come to visit us. Another man appeared, and at sight of him, Janimard's mirth redoubled. Oh, oh, we had no idea of this. Ah, oh, my friends, you're in a bad fix now. Who would have ever suspected it? Turning to Sholmes, Janimard introduced the man. Victor Leroux, a detective from our office, one of the best men in the Iron Brigade. Edmond.